Welcome to the Pod Doctors. I'm Dr. Damian Dauphiné, and I'm here with my partner, Dr. Rafi Hussein. And today we are going to do an overview of gout. Gout is uh, a very common problem, and really didn't have a whole lot of new stuff for gout until relatively recently. Yeah, it, it was pretty much treatment of symptoms. I mean, mm-hmm. very little um, controlling the disease type of um, uh, treatment options. Um, Just some old stuff, stuff that had been around for fifty years or more, <laughs> and now now we've got some some good medications that. Uh, Gotcha. Oh, yeah, Elaine Bennis doing the dance. That's awesome. But we've seen a, a, some really horrible cases of this yeah. coming in the office recently, some that look make this look like nothing, really. Yeah, so what happens? People come in, they get a red-hot, swollen joint. Some of them know that they have gout. Some of them suspect that they have gout. And some of them think they have, like, a crazy infection going on or some type of a injury fracture, or a yeah. fracture. <clears throat> They're just instant, like... Oh my God, this pain is 9 out of 10. <laughs> I mean, I can't touch it. The sheets can't touch it. They, they'll come in. I've had patients come in without shoes on, yeah. the foot that has gout. And it could be 27 degrees outside, yeah. and they're like, nope, can't do it. Uh, that's what they call this the great imposter. Yeah. So, you know, syphilis, they call that the great imposter. <laughs> so, called call gout the great imposter because it could be a number of different things. So, the workup uh, does require us to usually get some blood work, get some x rays, see what's going on. Yeah, so what do most people know about gout? They're like, it's some type of arthritis, inflammation of the joint. Um, They don't know what it's caused by. They'll assume it's, you know, just being lazy, not eating well, genetics, which, you know, are all um, parts of it. And they'll think it's only to the toe, right? They won't realize that it could be elsewhere. It could be the ankle. It could be the foot. It could be the elbow. They could be the ear. I mean, there's different, different areas that you can see um, flare up and obviously the most common is the big toe joint I think they estimate like 90 plus percent of the time it'll be the big toe joint but it does happen elsewhere it doesn't have to solely happen to the big toe joint and why does it happen in those extremity joints because things are get, coming out of solution yeah. uh, the, the crystals are are coming out of solution because you've got joints that are cooling off yeah. they're further away they are from the heart it's, I tell my patients, it's almost like sugar and water, right? right? You put sugar and water, and everything is nice and warm closer to your body. So nice warm water, sugar will dissolve easy. Once you start bringing the, the water temperature down, that sugar starts crystallizing. That's how they make rock candy, you know? Like So when you get come, uh, more distal to your toes, to your ears, elbows, very common, you'll, you'll see some of those crystals start depositing, you know? That's when people start feeling that sharp pain. Because it causes... Tremendous inflammation. It's literally glass in your joints. They, they, yeah, you look at these under a microscope and they look like little daggers. Yeah. So, uh, what is gout? And we just kind of just touched upon it. It's literally a crystalline disorder where you get uric acid crystals inside the joint. It's it's literally glass in your joint. I mean, I don't know how many times we can uh, phrase that, and people yeah, don't realize. They're like, oh, it's a, it's a, it's arthritis. It's swollen. It's tender. Uh, can you give me some pain medication? It'll go. It'll get better. And yes, it will get better because obviously you'll have flare-ups. But we got to treat the problem. I mean, we we know that ninety percent of these are due to an underexcretion problem at the kidney level, and then ten percent of these are a overproducer. But what does that really mean? You know, people are like you know, um, we're treating the flare-ups. We're we're uh, ad- addressing the initial pain. But what are we doing long run for these? So this is kind of where we go into the whole metabolic side of this. Gout is a multifaceted problem. You're looking at a metabolic disease where it affects the kidneys, the heart, uh, the, uh, the the liver. I mean, uh, it, it's much more complex than I think, you know, we even yeah, uh, most, considered it, um, you know, as surgeons. I think what we're finding out is, is that this is a harbinger of all kinds of pathology in the body, multi-system pathology that yeah. you can't. Uh, just blow off as, hey, it's just a swollen joint. Yeah, come this in, is sign give of, a steroid this, shot, and yeah. it's gone. This is a sign of a serious problem that that um, uh, can be a harbinger or, or a view into other systems that are breaking down, need to be addressed. Yeah, so we're hopeful that there's going to be a slow transition to people who have gout, that we start working with other specialties and treating this, nephrologist, yeah. Yeah, endocrinologist, uh, because diabetes, um, hypertension, kidney disease... All of these have a big factor into this here. I think I have a slide. 
Okay, so here's here's a little point on the kidney problem. As your glomerular fl- filtration rate goes down, your your kidneys, as they're able to filter less and less and less as your kidney disease progresses, the risk of diabetes, I mean diabetes, the risk of gout um, multiplies. You're not just going up by a small percentage. Right. You're doubling, tripling. You're uh, as the the problem goes on, your your risk of gout is multiplying. Even when you're on dialysis with you know therapies. Your risk of gout is so much higher. It's just hard to regulate the uric acid. Yeah. <clears throat> so here we kind of talked about uh, things that kind of add to your risk of gout, and we'll do our diagnosis. You know, conservatively, medical uh, history. We'll do our diagnosis with aspiration and, and uric acid level. So if the patient has the risk factors, you know, diabetes, hypertension, kidney disease, hyperlipidemia, meaning obesity, um, we're adding these things into our our, our um, our patient medical history, and hopefully transitioning to a diagnosis of gout coming through. Uh, we'll do our aspiration sometimes if we if we feel like all right, this is most likely gout. We see some telfi and things. We'll pull some fluid and may send that off to see if it's you know crystalline. Um, and this then, is a great. This normal uric acid is meaningless. Oh yeah. That that <clears throat> I think that crystallizes. Our, our newer understanding, I think a more modern understanding of yeah. gout and, and how these numbers don't really line up with the clinical picture very well. So there was a there was a book that came out that I, I know you and I just both read right. um, about how they <clears throat> showed that based on body temperature, your uric acid levels versus flare-ups play a much different uh, role. You can have a uric acid level of our 5 or a 6, which is within the normal threshold, but if your body temperature is lower, say you live in a cold environment, you know, you live in uh, Buffalo, New York, right? The risk of your gout flare-ups are much higher because the crystals can dissolve out a lot faster versus... Well, if precipitate you have a, out. Yeah, right. precipitate out right. um, a lot faster versus if you have like a 7 or an 8, yes, you have a higher risk of gout flares. But if you're living in a higher temperature environment... So Miami, you're living Florida. In, yeah, uh, yeah. Your risk of those uh, gout flares are so much lower. Uh, it's, it's, it's a... Phenomenal balancing act, and, and the book is so good. I don't, I don't know where it is. I have it somewhere. But uh, shout out to whoever wrote that book. We and the other thing I think that we've you know f- fully a- appreciated over the years is that you can have somebody who's at a high end of normal. By the time you send them out for blood work, they've yeah. had this acute attack for two or three days. It's already starting to wane, and yeah. now they're they're normalizing their numbers. But they're this is clearly gout. Yeah. You know, so so you can have somebody with a six point five <clears throat> who's, who's on the end who's on the end of that flare, and that's still somebody that we're going to start to treat. Yeah, I had that guy who had a seven point four, and according to the patho- the the lab, the range the yeah. range is anything above eight point four is uh, you know a pathologic risk for uh, uh, gout. So they didn't even acknowledge that. So I'm like looking through the labs, and I'm like, oh, the uric acid is elevated. But according to them, it's not. And he's having an acute gout flare. Right. You know, so. So again, and, that's body temperature. We've had some really cold weather this yeah. last week. So <laughs> clearly. In the 20s today. In the 20s today here yeah. in, in the Metroplex. So, um, yeah, it's you're going to see. you. There are probably gout attacks happening all over the Metroplex. Yeah, they say week. between <laughs> the U.S. population, 4 to 6% of the population has gout. Uh, and it's still it's still it's under primarily diagnosed. males uh, yeah. until you get to to postmenopausal women, and then it seems to be roughly even. Yeah. So if you're pre premenopausal women, don't get this very often, mm-hmm. it's relatively um, in infrequent. But then once once you re- reach menopause, you're just as likely. So <clears throat> there's two types of gout, right? Uh, you know, putting those in parentheses. There's gout and there's pseudo gout. So when we send these aspirates, right, you'll get um, um, the readback um, negatively biofringens, which is uh, just a polarized test to see kind of uh, how those crystals are. And they'll let you know that it's uric acid crystals versus uh, calcium phosphate crystals, right? So if you're positive biofringens, you'll see these um, rhomboid-shaped um, um, uh, crystals inside the joint versus when you have classic gout, the monosodium urate crystals, you'll have these little needles mm-hmm. inside the joint. The treatment for them are pretty much very similar and uh, along the same pathway, but this there is a little bit of a, a difference. But today we're going to be talking more commonly your your urea, uh, urate type of uh, uh, gouty attacks. So X-rays. All right, patient comes in, swollen foot. We're like, let's get some images. Let's rule out infection, fracture, trauma, whatever have you. 
So we'll get these pictures, and I'd say 80, 90% of the time, they're very normal because it's, yeah, they're coming in for initial flare-up. Maybe right? they've had one or two yeah. flare-ups, and so they, you won't they have, haven't had enough. Yeah, you won't have this this aggressive <clears throat> breakdown. Now, the remaining time when they're having long-standing gout, and we know that this has been going on, or they're coming with tofi, you know, the, the crystals are literally building stones and pockets of... of uh, it it your, looks like a golf ball. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, that I mean, first literally. picture. Hold on, where was that? Yeah, this. yeah, and then, and then you know I I just did you know surgery on a guy because he couldn't wear shoes. It seemed yeah. so massive. That was at the great toe joint, so the metatarsal phalangeal joint right there. That was just massive. We spent forty five minutes trying to clean all the crud it's, in and around that joint out of the joint capsule. It's it was just an absolute like mess. Chalky glass like looking toothpaste. Yeah, it, when it's liquidy and then chalky. Yeah, it's weird stuff, man. But but I think um, the Martell sign, you know, that's that's where you're getting the erosive changes. Yeah, that marginal erosion, periarticular erosion. So that those you just don't see them that often. But when you see them, it's like wow, that is impressive. Yeah, and the yeah. reason that they're they're <clears throat> forming there, it's literally it's 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 I don't know pathology, biomechanics, whatever you want to call it. You're you're moving the joint around. Those crystals are, are flying through that joint, and the pocket where the <laughs> the joint has a little overhang in that capsule, and they're just sitting there. They're literally physically just being moved around and pocketing into the side of those joints so that <laughs> those crystals are slowly sanding away. And it's and probably the inflammation as well oh, is yeah. breaking down the bone. But we literally, the one I just did, we had to bone graft this guy. Yeah. He had so much bone loss. Yeah. You get so these much little, erosion that we had to bone graft it or his whole joint would have fallen apart. Yeah, you get these little pockets, that, that erosion. You'll get these little cortexes, which are overhanging from, from everything that's kind of being broken down. Uh, further along, you'll get like the mushrooming or the cup and cone type of deformities uh, if they're not treated soon enough. And obviously, uh, you know, we'll talk about going into treatment options for these. Um, so stages of gout, there's no real formula for stages but you know initial stage is the first flare-up you'll have the urea kind of building up in the in the system the uric acid levels are elevating and, and maybe they'll have some aches and pains associated with um oh i just had a steak and or i'm taking i started a new medication and like it hurts for a day or so and, and they're like all right it got better dehydration and clearly makes dehydration, this worse so yeah, yeah the 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 um blood pressure medications where where you're you're peeing out all that fluid yeah. You know any of those those medications, the lisinopril's, the yeah, yeah you're you got to be careful of getting dehydrated because you will precipitate a gout attack if you have the uh, preponderance for this for sure. So second stage, you got that gout attack. Patient comes in, we'll do the steroid shot, we'll put them on you know colchicine or indomethacin or whatever people like to use. There's a lot of options, um, and then we'll watch that hopefully calm down. Um, I'll, I'll usually recommend doing like hot water baths for the foot, you know, letting that, that extremity comfort. kind of yeah, right. warm up, hopefully allowing those crystals to dissolve out. Then you're getting to stage three where you're getting the flips multiple times a year. You know, you're you're like, all right, we need to start looking at next level options. And then obviously stage four, the, the tophi has formed, the joint is, you know, uh, damaged and beyond repair. And that's when we're talking about going in and surgically, you know, uh, repairing these joints or fusing these joints. So things that I guess people don't realize um, most people don't realize that gout is a type of arthritis. Seven in ten people don't know that gout is a type of arthritis. They just think it's some type of flare-up, this is an inflammation, and it'll go away. People think that it's a come-and-go deformity, meaning I have it now, and it's better. It's I, it's gone, you know? Yeah, it's not like a cold. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> and then uh, a, a good portion of them don't even realize that gout, when they have gout, it's not just inflammation of the joint. It's uric acid building up in your system. So we'll get labs routinely for these patients, and and usually, you know, like uh, they say, uh, every six months, and that's that's an ideal time. Just pretty much passively watching them. They're on their medications, and as long as that uric acid is within a comfortable range, and they're not having flare-ups, we're in the clear. Diet. So this is a big portion. A lot of people think that just by adjusting your diet, your gout is going to go away. Uh, look, you have diabetes, right? Just by adjusting your diet, the chance of your diabetes to go away is is, is very low. Right. I mean, you got to take medications. you got to do other things. Yes, diet does play a big part in gout, just like it does in diabetes, but you got to take care of it actively. Um, a lot of people, 6 out of 10, don't even take medication for it. They'll just be like, oh, I'm, uh, I've cut down on uh, alcohol, you know, beers. 
I've, I've cut down on uh, steaks. I only have it, you know, twice a week or whatever, you know. Uh, uh, I've cut down on shellfish, you know. And uh, it's, it's okay. I only have flare-ups once or twice a year. But you shouldn't even be having these flare-ups, you know. Um, and then, oh, here's a good one. The, uh, um, uh, what's it called? Tart cherry red juice. You, you've heard of this? Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is a, a classic. People swear by it. Yeah, a, a classic um, holistic therapy. I do believe it helps out, but it, you can't replace it for um, a medication. You can't be like, look, I'm not taking allopurinol. I'm just taking this tart cherry red juice extract pill or, or whatever. Um, it, look, it's just like everything else. Yeah, they say turmeric is good for bringing inflammation down. But when you have a real problem, you're going to take ibuprofen or a steroid or prednisone or whatever. And, you know, they say um, your cholesterol is high. Eat garlic, right? That's, that helps with cholesterol, I think. I don't know. Oat, but oatmeal. Oatmeal. You bring it down, uh, you know. Yes, there's things, you know, you can do holistically sure. that will help. And it's good adjunct. But you really got to be taking care of yourself in more advanced levels. Um, so yeah, when folks are in the seven, eight, nine range, yeah, uh, you're not going to be able to manage this. And this has been going on for ten plus years, most commonly, <clears throat> right. and it's just slowly building up. It's not something that happened. Oh, you know, I went on a cruise, I had steak, you know, four days in a row, and this is why it flared up. I didn't have any problems before that. It As, was in the background. Yeah, that's not exactly yeah. how it went along. So here, here are some uh, some lists of comorbidities: um, diabetes, oh, coronary artery disease, heart disease. So common with these. I think I have a good picture of uh, um, some uric acid buildup inside of uh, someone's heart. Um, so when someone comes in with gout and they say they're otherwise healthy, yeah, the likelihood is they're not. And yeah. there are other comorbidities that just haven't been identified yet. Yeah. So those are people that we're now you know, sending that report back to the primary care doctor and saying, hey, look, you really need to work this patient up. The likelihood is they've got hyperlipidemia, they've got hypertension, They've got some sort of chronic kidney disease. It, almost fifty percent of the time, yeah, that's that's probably the case. Uh, diabetes would be, you know, almost thirty percent of the time they've yeah. got they've got uh, metabolic syndrome or they're they're heading towards type two diabetes. So yeah, that these people clearly need a complete medical workup because the likelihood of these other comorbidities is pretty high. Yeah, because people think, you know, I'm going to come in, I'm going to get a steroid shot, I'm going to get some pain medication, and this will go away. Yeah. It, it doesn't really work like that. You're, it's, you're it's, really, it's a signal that there are other things going on, and yeah. so we should treat it like that. And I think up until this point, we've probably blown it off a little bit too, yeah. just 100%. treated it symptomatically. But you know, I think we've it's highlighted these studies that are coming out are really highlighting. When did that study get published? That's 2010. Gee, that's well, well, that's the thing with yeah. studies. They say it takes 20 years for a study yeah. to actually start catching ground. Right. So yeah, this isn't exactly new new information, but I think. Most of us who are treating these folks are really, we got blinders on and we're treating the symptomatic, uh, we're using a symptomatic approach and it really needs to be more of a complete medical workup. So here's what I was saying. They, they literally scanned the heart and they were able to see the oh, uric God. acid inside the heart. Where kinda, you know, Inside the spinal cord. The spinal cord, Jeez. the vertebrae. Right. This is, this is uh, the heart. You're literally in the... In the uh, ventricles. I mean, this is this is crazy. I mean, this is things that we don't realize how much is truly affecting you. So initial treatment. All right. So I, I put a bunch of medications here. Everyone has their you know their tricks and and things. Um, most classically, most people will probably agree that they'll do colchicine as an acute flare up or indomethacin as an acute flare up, mm -hmm. and they'll do long term allopurinol. Some people will add prednisone to this. Some people will talk about doing probenicid. Um, other things that we typically will do is uh, steroid shots. You know, we'll try to aspirate the joint if we can, and then we'll drop some steroid to physically calm that joint down, bring that inflammation down as much as possible. Um, real simple things. It gives patients a quick, quick um, recovery compared to just trying to do waste on medications. Medications, I'll say it takes four, five, six, seven days. With a steroid shot, you're looking at two to three days. Just personal experience. If the patient can tolerate it. That's true. Because that hurts. <laughs> you're, you got an you're, inflamed joint. Someone's coming at you with a needle. <laughs> and that cold spray. Oh, this dude. is just a generic picture of a steroid shot. I didn't, I didn't <laughs> look up a gout joint for this. But, yeah, cold spray makes it worse. Um, you know, it, it is what it is. I tell my patients, no pain, no gain. You know, yeah. if, if we can get you comfortable faster, great. If you want to hold off and just let the medications do its magic, great. I just want you to get better, you and, know. And we really had – this has been the standard – for decades and decades and decades. Yeah. And then Euloric came out, which was 
finally something new. Yeah. Uh, and now we have Christexa. We've got some other medications. Yeah. yeah. So, so these are these are really interesting ways of attacking some of this stuff without the requiring maybe as, as much emphasis on surgery for some of the big bad yeah. TOFI. So I've been doing Christexa for the last I don't know two three years. Nothing crazy long. So I'm I'm going to touch this you know with a, a grain of salt type of thing. Um, Christexa is a medication that literally takes your uric acid and it changes from urate to allotonin. Urate, you can only excrete out about 10% per day. So you've you're got a, a high influx of, of this uric acid in your system, and you're not able to get rid of it as fast. The uh, Christexa is actually based off of um, a um, chemical or, or a, um, a um, uh, um, um, what's it called? A protein that is found in animals, which most animals are able to convert that urate to allotonin, and so they don't have these gout type of flare-ups. So what has happened is we've taken that general concept, and now we're doing the same. So these patients will come in with TOFI, with flare-ups multiple times a year, and they'll go through this medication regimen, and they'll go in every two weeks, I don't know, for about uh, three to four months, and they'll infuse them with that Christexa, and Mm -hmm. hopefully get all that uric acid system uh, almost, flushed. almost wash it all yeah. out. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> it's phenomenal. You'll literally see these gouty tofi on their feet or hands and, that, and elbows and things kind of just shrink away. It's, that, that mean mean reduction of tofus volume within twenty eight weeks of almost ninety five percent. That's crazy. Yeah, it's that's literally just washing it all out. So yeah, I think I think I, I agree with you. We any, anytime a new medication comes down the pike, you, you know you want to you want to be careful with it. But yeah. I think this really seems to be. Uh, extremely helpful for patients, um, and and I think we're, we've we're planning on bringing in a rheumatologist uh, to talk a little bit more, yeah. do a deeper dive into Christexa and talk about how it was developed, um, talk about how they're using it and their experience with it. Um, yeah, because a, I think a, the a rheumatologists lot, are doing a lot a lot more work with it than we are. Yeah, a lot better understanding of the of the chemical nature of this. So. Uh, 100%. Pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics. Yeah, yeah that, I think it would be interesting um, to to be able to hear from a rheumatologist. So we, we, we're planning on bringing somebody in to uh, talk about this. All right. So what happens when, you know, we're doing treatment and they're just having these TOFI? So sometimes we'll go in and physically wash out these joints. I say wash out with, you know, uh, quotations because you're literally just kind of scooping this debris out. Yeah. If you can take it out in solid portions, great. But a lot of the times you're literally going in, incision, and you're, you're squeezing all this gouty tofi out of their joints. It's it, and sometimes it's almost like you're moving a tumor. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, literally that bottom this. picture, you know, that looks, uh, you know, almost like you've just removed a tumor, and that's kind of what it looks like. It's walled off. It's chalky. It's just it's weird stuff. And, and the downside of surgical treatment for this, yes, you're getting the 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 uric acid crystals out of that joint. You're getting the tofi out of that joint. But you're treating a single joint here. Yeah. You know what I mean? You're, you're pinpointing the biggest problem sites and you're going and washing them out. Um, we'll do surgeries on patients and we'll, you know, a bunion, you know, I'm going in fixing it and I'll see crystals inside the joint and I'll be like, all right, we didn't realize he had gout. We're going to have to have a gout conversation right. after surgery um, because obviously surgery is going to f- yeah, flare that up. And we may find that we do fewer surgeries oh, yeah. with Christexa than we we do now but there are patients who clearly can't even wear shoes i mean yeah. sometimes these toe fight gets so big that they they yeah. literally can't wear shoes and, and some patients aren't ridiculous. candidates for crosecta you know Correct. g6pd Correct. Uh, you know problems uh, yep. if they have you know kidney problems if you know other problems financial problems insurance problems whatever it might be um so you know there, there's multiple ways to treat this so say the problem has gone on for so long we may need to go in and fix this surgically. So sometimes we'll we'll replace the joints and sometimes we'll fuse the joints. It just kind of depends on how bad the um, arthritis has been. Um, and it's per patient, honestly. Um, long-standing gouty tofi in a joint will breathe that joint out. I mean, you'll have no cartilage left. You'll be bone on bone. It's like hallux rigidus, arthritis, whatever you want to call it, right. mm-hmm. to the max. Yep. So sometimes we'll have to go in and fuse these joints, which, you know, it's not something you want to do, but it is something that happens. Uh, very, very rarely, but something that does happen. Yeah, the guy that I just did recently where we had to bone graft him, uh, you know, he's undoubtedly going to need a more definitive joint yeah. procedure at some point in the next decade, if not sooner. You know, n- n- despite the fact that we did all we could to save 
as much tissue as possible, he, he his bone was just so eroded. So even if the bone graft fills in those gaps, I'll be shocked if his you know, cartilage isn't completely destroyed over the next several years. Even with Christexa, we're still trying to get him approved. Yeah. Take, take some time. Yeah. They're requiring it's us insurance. to jump through a bunch of hoops. Yeah. But, you know, I think this guy is just the poster child for who needs it. We just have to jump through the hoops and yeah. to get it approved. I mean, that's pretty much it as far as, as gout goes. A good broad overview on things. Excellent. Very good. Yeah, we'll definitely follow this up with uh, an interview with... Uh, a, re- a rheumatologist about their uh, ideas around Christexa and, and how they treat gout. So, yeah. excellent. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Hussein, for this episode 42. Season three is well on its way, firing on all cylinders, talking about gout. And we will see you next time on the Pod Doctors.